Hello and welcome to the 164th episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Sunday the 29th of August 2021 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. This week we welcome back Professor Andrew Kleiman to the show. We get deep into some more value theory, specifically discussing the difference between concrete and abstract labour, simple and complex labour, and do slaves create value? In part two of this discussion, we jump off into a debate about my current love affair with the fundamental principles of communist production and distribution by Jan Appel and the group of international communists. Safe to say that Andrew does not see eye to eye with me on this one. Part two will be released during the week as a patron only episode. So if that tickles your fancy, head on over to the Patreon and throw me a few commie dollars. You get access to the back catalogue of patron only episodes the Emancipation Network Discord server, and can join in future reading groups such as the Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution reading group, which is nearly done and dusted. Oh yes, and this week, I also have the new patron, Donal Okusilva, to thank. Okay, to the interview. Okay, Andrew, thanks for joining us today. I emailed you a, a couple of weeks ago about a, an article on a blog. Let me see if I can see what the article was. It was an article on this uh, kind of a post-Keynesian kind of or a Keynesian blog called Social Democracy for the 21st Century, a realist alternative to the modern left. And they were talking about uh, a paper by Dave Zachariah, who hangs around and is a kind of fellow traveler with Paul Cockshot in that kind of a, a vibe. But there was an interesting thing I found in there where they were talking about this idea in Capital. I think it's in, uh, it might even be in the first chapter. You'll, conf- you'll be able to correct me or not. This division between simple and complex labor. Do you want to tell us a little bit about how Marx? talks about or theorizes about the difference between simple and complex labor. Right. Uh, as you say, it is in chapter one of volume one of Capital. It's in the second section where he is basically talking about the dual character of the labor it congealed in, in, in commodities. Uh, he returns to the uh, issue of simple and complex labor in, in chapter seven where again, he's dealing with the the dual role that labor plays in the capitalist production process. Labor is an input that uh, is among the things that produces products, but it also creates value in commodity producing societies, you know, capitalism and and such. So uh, that's the dual character of labor. Abstract labor creates the value, concrete, useful labor produces products. This kind of lines up with the kind of use value value distinction. Absolutely. Okay. So it's when with reference to the product, the product has a dual character. It's a use value, a useful object, serves human needs of whatever sort. But in a commodity producing society, the product is also a carrier of value. So, you know, it has a value, it is a value. And the same thing with the labor that produces it. Okay, but Marx also gets into the issue of simple and complex labor, or in more colloquial terms, unskilled and skilled labor. And there's a measurement issue here because he says, well, you know, how much value does the worker's labor add? Well, the labor uh, of a skilled worker adds more value that because it's skilled, that's that's misleading to say that it adds more value because it's skilled. But it's correct, but it's misleading. Anyway, the, the labor of a skilled worker adds more value than the labor of an unskilled worker. Or complex labor, one hour, creates more value than an hour of simple labor. And then the question is, how much? And Marx basically defines the degree of complexity, and he says that the degree of complexity depends on the cost of the training, essentially, that's involved in producing the skill. Okay, so you go to engineering school uh, or you're on a period of apprenticeship, there's cost involved in that. And in proportion to the extra cost of producing 
that uh, skilled labor power, it's the same proportion for the increment to value. So if somebody's labor power or ability to work costs double that of a simple laborer, then during the same hour or whatever, they create double the amount of value. That's, that's what Marx says. So a skilled labor of a certain type is worth twice the, of the simple labor of another sort, dependent on the amount of training, the cost of the training to get it to that point, to become skilled. Is that what you're saying? Basically, although I'm sure, as you know, in Marx's theory, labor has no value. It creates value. So it's not that the, the labor has a value. It's the labor creates an amount of value. Yes. Okay. So like, let's say you have a, a, a doctor take seven years of training and say a computer programmer takes three. So what are we saying there with respect to complexity of, say, those two versus completely unskilled labor? Right. Well, I mean, there's a certain cost involved in just creating uh, simple labor power. I mean, you know, people do go to school and they get raised and there's all kinds of uh, learning by doing. So to actually measure this would be a, a real project. Somebody would have to sit down and think about it. OK, so it's not just the amount of direct time that you need. You know, you go into a factory and they give you a two week uh, probationary period. You can't just count that. You have to talk about the total cost of just producing unskilled ability to work. I mean, there's a certain degree of skill already there. So just in conventional terms, it's unskilled, but there's a great degree of skill there. So, I mean, I don't know. Let, let's say that that's, you, you got a lot of teachers, you got all kinds of things involved. I mean, I, so I can't answer it, but, uh, you know, if I take a number, then I can do, then I can do the math, you know? So let's say that that's six years worth of labor needed to train an unskilled labor power. Uh, and the, the computer programmer has an additional three. So during the same period of time, three is half of six. During the same period of time, they create 50% more value than an unskilled worker. And the, the, the seven for a doctor, seven is 117% of six. So they would create a little bit more than double the same amount of uh, value during the same period of time. Was there a part in that capital, it's a while now since I've read the chapter, it's maybe two years, that where Marx said also there was cultural and societal norms that come into determining the different complexities of labor? Uh, no, I think you're referring to where he says that there, there's a historical, moral, cultural standard for what is the necessary means of subsistence of a worker and therefore the value of their labor power. That's what it, it requires to to reproduce their ability to work. You reproduce them. I mean, that might require. I mean, nowadays, you know, you need a computer with a uh, yeah, an internet connection and and, and so forth. And in, in, in most places, you know, you need a refrigerator, you need uh, a phone, and, and and things like that. That you know, in Marx's day, you didn't need. So there's a historical and, and moral element involved in you know, what it is that people need. It's not just, you know, uh, subsisting on gruel, you know. But, but, but that's one issue. That's, you know, what people actually receive as pay. It's a completely distinct issue, the amount of value that they create. Okay, yes. Okay, so, so the Keynesian economist, Joan Robinson, like, has this critique that Marx needed to reduce all heterogeneous human labor time to a, a meaningful homogeneous unit so like this ability to be able to compare sewing with doctoring with a truck driver that to compare all these separate things there need to be a, a common unit and the claim is that that marx never really explained how this happens is that a fair obviously this is a, a critique we, do you think this is a fair critique well the, the way you stated it the, the point is accurate and Marx does address it. The problem with Joan Robinson and all of these people, critics of Marx, people who think they like Marx, they are confusing and conflating two different things. Okay, One is the qualitative homogeneity of labor. If you're going to, you know, add two kinds of labor together or say that, you know, a truck driver has done during a day twice as much work as a computer programmer or, you know, as a cashier, 
you seem to be comparing unlike things quantitatively. And you can't do that. That's an apples and oranges problem. Like can only be measured against like and, and so forth. So when we talk about different labors and we kind of add them up or compare them, we're not really talking about unlike labors. There is at least at least a mental abstraction going on. We are abstracting from the different concrete characteristics of the labors. You know, this person writes code, this person scans the, the products to ring up, uh, you know, how much to charge the customer and so forth. Those are the concrete laboring activities. They differ. Okay. However, when we abstract from those differences, what they're both doing is labor. And that is, that is at least part of what Marx means by abstract labor. I mean, there is a mental abstraction involved. I'm not saying that it's only a mental abstraction, but there is a mental abstraction involved. We disregard or set aside the concrete, useful activities that produce heterogeneous, you know, different kinds of products, and we just focus on the fact that this is labor. Okay, so that is Marx's basic unit, a unit of abstract labor. Okay, so an hour of simple abstract labor, you know, could be associated with computer programming, can be associated with standing there as a cashier, could be associated with a bunch of things. But not only is everybody doing a concrete physical activity, they are also all performing abstract labor you know, and that, that matters insofar as the creation of value. Now, what Joan Robinson and a hell of a lot of people have gotten into is this idea that you somehow first have to reduce complex labor to simple labor in some quantitative way before you can talk about the amount of abstract labor that people do. And I, I think that that just does not make any sense whatsoever. Their idea is, ah, Marx talks about the amount of labor performed, but some of it is labor of doctors, and some of it is labor of computer programmers, and some of it is, you know, labor of truck drivers, uh, and, and so forth. You know, we have to say, according to them, how much value each of these things creates before we have a common unit. I think that that's just ass backward. So you, you, you basically have to show there is a common unit and then measure which they are, essentially. I may, maybe. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I think so. Like I mean, it, the argument is not measure the differences first to show a commonality, but kind of go from commonality to, to a measurement, perhaps. Yeah. Let me put it this way. People just need to think about the categories that they're using. When we talk about simple labor and complex labor, we're not talking about simple writing code versus complex writing code. We're not talking about simple surgery activity versus complex surgery activity. We're not talking about simple and complex scanning of products, okay? We're talking about simple and complex labor as such, okay? We're abstracting from the concrete use values produced. So we are already talking about abstract labor. We are no longer talking about concrete labor, even though some of these activities have required more training, et cetera, et cetera. When, when we talk about simple and complex labor, we are abstracting from the physical nature of the activities. Okay, We're focusing perhaps on the amount of training time, the amount of value created per hour, but we're talking about abstract labor. So there is the prior issue of what kind of labor we're talking about, concrete labor or abstract labor. But once we've got the abstract labor, then abstract labor can be added to abstract labor. Two hours of abstract labor is twice as much as one hour and so forth and so on. So both simple and complex labor are abstract labor, and there is no problem of, you know, having to reduce the one to the other until you have a unit of measurement. Joan Robinson makes this error. Nitzan and Bichler make this error. It's there in the Social Democratic blog post. It's very, very common. But 
conceptually, it just does not make any sense. And I, I think what the underlying problem is, is that people really are not attentive to the fact that when they talk about labor, they are talking about abstract labor. I mean, you know, you, you have, say, 400,000 hours of labor were performed, you know, last month in the United States. The government computes these statistics, you know. How is the government able to do it? You know, it doesn't have some complex, you know, procedure of reducing this to that. An hour of labor is an hour of labor. How much value is created per hour is a different issue. But the point is that if you're going to add these labor hours together, what is happening is that those hours are qualitatively indistinguishable. Not not, not quantitatively, but qualitatively indistinguishable. They're of the same sort. And how is that, that they're of the same sort, given that some people are writing code, some people are driving trucks? It's because we abstract from the differences, we abstract from the physical things produced. You had a good example in the paper you sent me. Let me just give the name of this paper. I'll put it in the show notes for people, but it's the duality of labor you wrote with with Ted McLone. Yeah, you won't be able to find that paper online, I don't think, uh, or maybe maybe I've got a pre-pub because it's in a book collection that was published a pretty long time ago. But you, you, you talk about comparing this to a car index. I don't know if you remember that example, but I found it a very, a very clear way to think about this. Yeah. Actually, let me see. I might as well just read it because it's yeah. short and I did it better than I can speak it. Yeah. So I say once the two reductions, reduction of concrete labor to abstract labor, reduction of complex labor, simple labor, once the two reductions are understood as being distinct, it's no longer necessary to specify a rule for the reduction of complex and simple labor before one can accept the real-world existence of abstract labor. It's no longer a theoretical problem. It becomes a measurement problem, an index number problem. Here's an analogy. Government statisticians attempt to quantify how many cars of some base year are equivalent to one 1999 car of presumably higher quality. Okay, there's guesswork, there's arbitrary assumptions, but the measurement difficulties cause no one to believe that this calls into question the idea that cars exist, as do auto workers who produce them, or the idea that the number of cars increases if more are produced than are consumed. Similarly, the measurement difficulties involved in attempting to quantify The relation between complex and simple labor should cause no one to believe that this calls into question the idea that value exists, as does abstract labor which produces it, or the idea that value self-expands if more is extracted from workers than they receive. So none of capital's theoretical results depend on the specification of a rule for the reduction of complex simple labor. It's it's interesting because like a couple like we kind of see these uh, critiques that like we keep on coming across like in this like th- that Marx should have had a, an individual theory of price of a of a commodity or something as opposed to the understanding these like general abstract uh, logic of the system. It's there always seems to be again and again this kind of idea of well he didn't explicitly exactly give a theory for this thing therefore you must throw out the baby with the bathwater. Yeah, I mean people are always trying to turn capital into a book which is everything you always wanted to know about capitalism but were afraid to ask. Yeah, uh, it's not that. It's a book about capital. It's about the essential relations of capitalist production, the capital-labor relation. It's not about everything. But I'll tell you, I I think another reason why this is among the issue that people continually come back to, it's a petty bourgeois or middle-class thing to be offended that, you know, the activity that they engage in is fundamentally indistinguishable not in every sense, but in a very relevant sense from the activity of, you know, people who just went to high school or, you know, didn't graduate college or anything like that. You know, it's all labor. It's all abstract labor. It's all the same stuff. People, you know, take offense at that. That's definitely true. So how does this play into then this idea of simple and complex labor? 
and being able to, not to say that you're able to measure the different ones, but how does, say, the aggregation of, say, government statistics to kind of understand in an economy how value is increasing or decreasing, like, does it come into the statistical analysis that you ever do? You're talking about actual empirical estimations? Yeah, when you're trying to make your, you know, value rate of profit estimates for uh, right. the profit in your, your book on, uh, what is it, the, the failure of capitalist production. Right. Basically, I and I think everybody else, or almost everybody else, I mean, typically people ignore this, and we ignore it because we don't have adequate data. And actually, that's okay as long as the proportions among the different complexities of labor hasn't changed over time. You know, so if uh, 40% more unskilled laborers and 40% more skilled laborers, you don't need to, to do the computation. So in, embedded in all of these numbers is an assumption that there has not been too much change in the proportions of complex and simple labor. Do we have any like longitudinal studies on the amount of like skilled versus unskilled laborers in like in economies like the US? Are there indexes available on that, I wonder? I mean, there, there, there's stuff. I think, you know, maybe there are people who try to investigate it. It's not like statistics that you can just, you know, go to a site and, and, and download. I mean, but there are things that people can do. If one has a, an, an interest in these questions, there, there are, I think, ways of, of, of trying to do the estimation. You know, it, it depends on one's purposes. What Mark said is, look, given the kind of investigation and analysis that I'm doing in capital, I, I don't need to deal with this. And I think he was right. You know, for the purposes of his analysis, he says, uh, we can assume that what we're talking about always is simple labor or complex labor having been reduced to some multiple of simple labor. In other words, if I say, you know, if Mar you know Marx, if I, if, if I say 10 hours of labor, that could be 10 hours of simple labor, or it could be four hours of simple labor and three hours of complex labor of a kind that creates double the amount of value. So three plus three plus four, that's 10. I mean, that, that, that's, he's saying, you know, assume that we've gone through all these superfluous computations. We, we get to that result. It's 10 hours. Okay. Yeah. Either yeah. way. It reduces. So, like, it's one thing I think that people get confused in this is that the, like, when we're talking about the value that the complex and the simple labor creates is different to the wage level of those different complex and simple labors. So, we might see a disparity, say, between the truck driver and the doctor that's a lot bigger than the disparity between the, the index between the simple and the complex labor. A absolutely. So when Marx is talking about simple and complex labor, he's talking about the cost of producing the labor power, the ability to work, the, the training expenses and so forth. He's not talking about the wages that are paid. And he actually has a footnote where he says exactly this. And he says also at that time or in that place, you know, don't get these things confused and also don't get confused by the words because a lot of the differences so-called between skilled and unskilled labor are purely conventional and not really based in differences in training time. On, on some level, when, it, when I think about the, the complex and simple labor distinction, it kind of seems to me that like with any complex labor, you know, like they do with machinery or whatever, you can break it down into simple components that require essentially no training. So like, it seems like really obvious that you could break down complex skilled labor into simple labor. Is that a correct way to think about it? No, I, no, I, I don't, I don't think it works like, like that. I mean, when, when you start to do time and motion study like that, which I think is what you're talking about, you, you, you run up against the problem. You're, you're dealing with concrete labor. You're dealing with particular uh, activities that have a particular purpose of particular, uh, producing a particular kind of, you know, physical useful thing or effect. 
So, you know, the, the basis on which Marx talks about this it is something you can do, which is to estimate the amount of labor that goes into training, the amount of labor that goes into producing this. That you can do. I don't, I don't think you can break down activities like this because the, the, the purpose to which the activity is put is, is always relevant. Actually, this is a bit of a detour now, but somebody, some people in our Discord server have been talking about uh, whether slavery was value producing or not. Where do you lie on this topic, Andrew? Slavery, when and where? Oh, well, that's, that, is, that to me is the kind of key question. Like, yeah, I got right to the point. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, um, like, so let's say, let's take ancient Rome. There would have been value producing, like there was commodity production in ancient Rome, wasn't there? Uh, yeah, kind of. Yeah, right. Yes, but to a smaller extent, and it wasn't. Yes, to a, sm- to, a, to a smaller extent, right, right. Yeah. So, like, would the slavery in, say, producing cotton or something in Roman times be value producing? Yes, I mean, technically speaking, yes. And it's only slavery in, in, in non-commodity production that we would consider not value production. Isn't that the distinction? Right. Right. I, 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 would, I would say that. I mean, what is, what, what is the, the, the point here is that whether the worker is formally free or not is, is not the criterion. The, the criterion is whether the labor has a dual character. And that has to do with the purpose of production. Okay, so this is the production for sale. So you have this concrete and abstract labor. Right. So that, that's how I understand it. I mean, I, I, don't, I can't tell you where like, Marx actually said it in so many words, but you know, he definitely understood that in the plantation south in the U.S., the slaveocracy, he definitely understood that... The production of cotton was a big deal on the world market, <laughs> uh, you know, and the English proletariat helped free the slaves by preventing the entrance of their government on the side of the South in the Civil War, despite the fact that those people desperately wanted cotton for their factories. So, yeah, and it, 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 Marx actually says, you know, even the character of slavery in the U.S. changed once it became not just growing, you know, crops or doing whatever for the immediate consumption of the, the slave owners and their families, but it became part of this world market for cotton. And so it's, you know, all of the horrors of just slavery. On top of that, you get all of the modern horrors of capitalist production. And so the lives of the, the slaves were, were, were made even worse. And they, they, they were used up more quickly, they died earlier, and so forth. Marx, Marx analyzes U.S. slavery not as a distinct you know, system that's separate from capitalist production, but as an integral part of capitalist production as it actually existed. Yeah, and the produce of slave stuff was like in the circuit of capital, explicitly, like people are making profits. You know? Well, yeah, I mean, cotton, cotton was a very big deal. Commodity, yeah. Very big deal in Marx in Marx's day. He had a friend who was, uh, you know, a textile manufacturer named Frederick Engels, up there that. in Manchester. And it, like I heard Chomsky before saying that cotton was essentially the oil of the nineteenth century. Is that is that true? Was it the most important commodity at the time? Well, in, in a certain sense, you know, it was the big deal because. Textile manufacturing was the the industry that had really, you know, taken off capitalistically. You know, like most of agriculture had not. All kinds of other things had not. But yeah, textiles, uh, definitely, you know, sure. So it, it, it was like the first big Capitalized capitalist, industry. you know, industry, industry kind of th- thing that, that, that was big, yeah. Okay, so in, in your paper that we've been kind of basing some of the stuff here on the simplex and the complex labor called the duality of labor, there's also a part where you talk about how this dual nature of labor, this idea of a worker doing both abstract 
and concrete labor at the same time when they're doing commodity production has kind of morphed. I presume this is the kind of value form school that you're trying to debate in this paper, where the concrete labor was seen to have a position in production, but the abstract labor seems to be tied to mar market exchange. Would you like to discuss a little bit of what was going on in, in this section of the paper? Yeah, well, actually, we began actually with, with that idea, and it really was not limited to, and not that comment was not directly about, you know, somebody who was a value form theorist, but about Bruce Roberts, but uh, he had a similar idea. These ideas have been kicking around, or you get somebody like uh, Moisha Pastone. In all of these people's thinking, you know, if you look, Physically, at what people do in their conception, people are physically engaged only in concrete labor. They are not also engaged in performing abstract labor, according to the people's conception. The value form people, Bruce Roberts, Moshe Pastone, and so forth. You know, so we, we begin by saying Marx inherited his usage of concrete and abstract from prior philosophers, especially Hegel, but concrete means it's a complex unity of diverse elements. Abstract means separated from the complex unity. Those meanings of abstract and concrete have often been jettisoned, and we say all too often concrete labor now seems to be construed as work that workers actually do so that abstract labor becomes ineffable. Something other than what workers do, but still somehow a kind of labor. And it's actually, you know, very hard to understand what people are talking about when they talk about abstract labor because it's no longer labor, right? Yeah, it's just. I don't know if you've ever read Moshe Postone's book, Time Labor, Social Domination. No, and it hasn't. Could, okay. If you could figure out what he means by labor, <laughs> you, you know, but, but, but it's not the work that workers actually do. And in the value form conception, it's really not work that workers do. And in Bruce Roberts' conception, it was not either. Their basic thinking is any, any work that workers actually do, we call that concrete labor. And then abstract labor is this other thing. And, you know, once it becomes some other thing, then it can, you know, arise by the sale of product. After the workers work, there's a product, they work, there's a product, after that there's a sale, and it's the sale of the product that makes the labor retroactively abstract. You know, and that just makes a mockery, of course, of, of, of Marx's value theory, because Marx says that the, the abstract labor creates the value. So, you know, in, in this conception, well, the, the workers produce the products, and then they, they, they get sold, and that makes the labor abstract. So it's the sale of the product that makes the labor abstract that makes it have a value. So price is determining the fact that the labor is abstract, which is determining the value of the product. It makes no sense. You have a quote in there from Marx where it's very explicit. You, you see, I think it's from the resultate. What, what is the resultate? I haven't heard of that before. Uh, results of the immediate process of production, or sometimes it's translated the results of the direct process of production. This is a manuscript that was not included in Volume 1 of Capital. What Marx originally wanted to do was to publish uh, Book 1 on the immediate or direct process of production, and then Book 2 was going to be on the circulation and uh, reproduction of capital. We, we basically have that, Volume 1, you know, Volume 2. But what happened is, as he's moving you know, forward, preparing the manuscripts, he, he's got a sense that he's not going to be able to get this volume two, much less volume three. He's, he's, he's not going to get this prepared for publication anytime soon, maybe not in his lifetime. So in what we now know as volume one, and he publishes as volume one, we have more than just the analysis of the immediate process of production. You know, that takes us through like chapter 15, chapter 16. Then he's got stuff on wages. He's got stuff on the accumulation of, of capital and so forth and so on. And what we now know is volume one. So volume one is more than what was book one. But prior to that point, before Marx decided to include these other elements, 
he had this idea of book one, and then there was going to be a transition to book two on the circulation and reproduction of the total social capital. And that he, he's, he's working on this manuscript, which is called The Results of the Immediate Process of Production. And it's a, it's a bridge between what was book one, what was book two. It did not get published because Marx gave up this idea of book one, book two, and he put in elements of, you know, book two and other stuff already in volume one. So he did not need that bridge. In fact, what there are few remnants of that bridge that appear in chapter 16 of volume one. So he had a very short transition instead of a very long transition. But he abandoned that idea of, you know, this kind of longest transition Pretty late in the day, volume one gets published in 1867, and the results of the immediate process of production or direct process, I think this was actually, at least some of it was written in 1866, only a year before, but let me check that. I think in my abridged capital volume, I have an abridged one of, I think it's a Penguin one or an Oxford Classics, they have yeah. it as a, an addendum, kind of a couple of extra chapters. Right. It's, it's, it's in the, yeah, it's in the, it's in the, the Penguin. It follows the, it's an appendix, and the note says it seems to have been written between June 1863 and December 1866. So that seems to be the, at least at that time, what, what, uh, Ernest Mandel wrote this. So, yeah. There's a great quote. I, let me just read the, the quote here that I've uh, highlighted. The transformation of money into capital takes place through the mediation of circulation because it is conditioned by the purchase and sale of labor power in the market. It does not take place in circulation, because what happens there is only an introduction to the valorization process, which is entirely confined to the sphere of production. That's actually in volume one. That's in chapter seven. Okay. Well, like, does, is that not just like a, that seems to be incredibly explicit. It is incredibly explicit. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's a very important statement in context because Marx has said we need to explain where the profit comes from. We need to explain the origin of surplus value. And in chapter five, he says, look, the surplus value has to arise in circulation, but it can't arise in, in circulation. You know, uh, he's setting all these traps and, and, and all, all this stuff. And so, he, he shows, you know, how he thinks it works. It's all based on the difference between labor and labor power. And even though there's a sale and purchase of value, you still get the surplus value. So he says, here's the sense in which it arises in circulation. Here's the sense in which it doesn't arise in circulation. You had a great couple of interviews when you, on your MHI podcast that I, I really recommend everybody to listen to on this stuff. I think it gets in a bit more detail with uh, Patrick Murray. And it seems to break down for me to be like you, you made this point about whether what happens in the marketplace is, is a epistemological point, not an ontological point. Do you want to kind of expand on what you meant by that? Well, right. I mean, basically... Murray and a lot of other value form theorists say, well, they use different terminology. Murray likes the terminology of potential versus actual. So he likes to say that a commodity is a potential value, that potential value is created in production prior to sale, but the commodity has an actual value only when it's sold. Okay, now Marx doesn't say anything of that sort. But why would that be the case? Well, they've got a number of arguments, but one of them is, hey, the capitalist, the owner of this commodity doesn't know that they're going to be able to get money for it until it's sold. You know, so does it have a value? They don't know what the value is. The only way that they're going to know what the value is, is by selling. Selling, you know, is the, the confirmation of the fact that the thing has value. The fact that the thing has value cannot be confirmed apart from or prior to sale. And that's absolutely correct. It cannot be confirmed apart from or prior to sale. That's a question of knowledge. It's not a question of being. It's not a question of what is. So there's a straightforward elementary confusion. 
And it happens again and again. The point is not to peck on Patrick Murray because this happens again and again and again. Straightforward confusion between ontological issues of what is, how things are determined, versus epistemic issues, what is known. There's also that idea as well, though, of lots of elements of capital may never enter the market, yet are booked financially at the value that they might have sold at, say. So a farmer who could sell all his hay only sells half and keeps the rest of it for his livestock. That would be in his books entered at a, what, what would it be in the market price if he had have sold it? Right, and this is a case, this is something that Marx discusses in that manuscript we were talking about, the results of the immediate process of production. And this is, you know, now a very big deal because it's called intra-firm trade. And it's a very important thing when you talk about multinational corporations where you've got a parent corporation and subsidiaries that are located in foreign countries. And so what is basically happening is the subsidiaries are let's say, producing raw materials for or assembling, you know, for the parent company. And so, you know, tax authorities are very, very interested in, you know, what is the right price versus the price that gets put on the books and so forth uh, as a way of shifting profits to subsidiaries in low taxation areas and, and, and so forth. But I mean, the fact is that these multinational corporations buy and sell to themselves a whole lot. It's a very, very, very big deal. And then when you think about it, then you get also within a country, you get different divisions, different plants, where it's not even international trade. So, you know, companies producing for, for themselves and, you know, buying and selling from themselves, it's a very big deal. I mean, you know, to take a very, very simple case that I like, electric power companies they produce the power that they use. Microsoft, you know, uses Microsoft products, etc. Poor bastards. Like, I think if you have a theory of value that's based in production like Marx's, it implies this ontological epistemological distinction. Like, there's no kind of two ways about it. I, I, I don't see any way you could maintain a theory of value in production with any type of this notion of of labor in exchange or or that they're implying through saying that's abstract labor it just seems entirely confused well is it confused or is it an attempt to confuse i mean i think there are a lot of people who just don't want a theory of value where the value arises in production they don't like it for whatever reason maybe they don't agree with it whatever it might be so you know if marx doesn't satisfy them, they have to create a Marx that does. And that's what they do. You know, so, so they, they pull out all these quotes and, you know, again and again, you know, when you look at the quotes, it's, it, there are a number of issues, but among the issues that arise is, is always, you know, Marx saying that the fact that the thing has value is only proven, you know, by the fact that the thing is sold. Absolutely. But that's an epistemological issue, not an ontological issue. It doesn't have to do with the determination of the amount of value. It has to do with seeing it, having it be confirmed, having it be known. Here's another quote from volume three from your paper. As soon as the amount of surplus labor it has proved possible to extort has been objectified in commodities, the surplus value has been produced. Now comes the second act in the process. The mass of commodities, the total product, must be sold. Talking about the TSSI, but that's like a temporal step. You have it, to it absolutely it. is, and it's it, you know it's very strange to me that you get value form people and others. They take that quote and they go, "Look, it has to be sold." Yeah, we know it has to be sold, dude. That's not the issue. Okay, the issue is that the production of value and the realization of value in the financial sense, the, the taking the value and getting that value in money form, that's what realization means. Those are two distinct things. They're separated in time, just as you said. And the, and the value itself will change over time. That's got to be said too. Like you produce an apple, it's ripe. 
every day you don't sell it, the, the value of that apple will probably deteriorate. So it's the value itself is right, and even price. even things that are not subject to much deterioration, like precious metals, their value changes. You know, you get discovery of new mines and so forth. So the the value will change. So so. You know, th- this is something that value, some value form theorists like to play on, is that, well, the value of the commodity at the time it sold may differ from the time when it was produced. Well, yeah, s- so what? And then, you know, you, you, a house is a commodity, and it, its value can go up, go down. Things don't have a value once and for all that's fixed. That, that, that's, that's a false issue. The question is really, in terms of the creation of value, since we're talking about creation of value, when the product is produced, what is the value that it has when it is produced? What, what determines that? Okay, And to somebody like Patrick Murray and other value form theorists, that, that's a meaningless question. And, you know, and because he, he kept talking about potential value, you know, the, in production, the labor creates potential value. And it's only an actual value when it's sold. Finally, I, I was like saying, what is potential value? I never saw the, the, the concept potential value in Marx. Are you saying that the commodity is only potentially a value when it's produced? And that what makes it a value is that it's sold? He, he basically said, yeah. So, I mean, that, that's, that, it's a theory. It's not Marx's theory, but it's, it's a theory in which Value is not created in, in, in production at all. What is created in production is physical stuff. And lo and behold, what's the potential here? The physical stuff can potentially be sold. So workers produce stuff. That stuff can potentially be sold. And if it's sold, then it has value. And that, that's the theory that's called, you know, value form analysis and all of this stuff. And it's the common sense of you know, your average bourgeois and everybody walking along the street. You know, people are entitled to that theory. Marx is also entitled to his. Because, like, Marx deals explicitly with that type of idea of value when he critiques, I think, is it Bailey in the first section? Yeah, he critiques Bailey. He he doesn't say much about Bailey in Chapter 1 of Capital. There are a few references, but he's got I don't know, three, four dozen pages in the um, theories of surplus value. Okay. On Bailey, yeah. Yeah. You know, your, your, your interpretation essentially devolves into Bailey's theories. You know, you're kind of going up against what Marx is really trying to get at. I think that's fair enough to say. That seems right to me. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, Marx quotes somebody, you know, it wasn't Bailey alone, but he quotes Barbon. Oh, right. I turn right to it. Note 7 in Chapter 1. Nothing can have an intrinsic value, Nicholas Barbon. Or as Butler says, Butler is the one I was thinking of. Butler has a little poem here. The value of a thing is just as much as it will bring. The value of a thing is just as much as it will bring. That's the theory. So there's a final section in that paper, Andrew, called How Labor Becomes Abstract. Physiological labor as alienated labor. What are you trying to get at with this section of the paper? You know, I wrote this together with Ted McLean over two decades ago, and I no longer remember what we had in mind. But I, I do know that there has been this issue of can abstract labor be physiological labor? Because if it's supposedly, some people say the following well, if it's physiological labor, it exists in all societies. It's not historically specific. And therefore, I don't know, I guess, therefore, in every society, there's abstract labor, creates value, and so, so forth. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly where people go. So a lot of people want to say that abstract labor is not physiological labor. First of all, that contradicts exactly what Marx says, because he says, yeah, it's right at the end of section two of uh, chapter one. On the one hand, all labor is an expenditure of human labor power in the physiological sense, and it is in this quality of being equal or abstract human labor that it forms the value of commodities. 
On the other hand, all labor is an expenditure of human labor power in a particular form and with a definite aim, and it is in this quality of being concrete useful labor that it produces use values. So, I mean, Marx says just flat out, you know, the abstract labor is physiological labor. And a lot of people just have a lot of trouble understanding then how the creation of value, which abstract labor creates value in Marx's theory, how the creation of value can be historically specific so that it's not the case that in every society labor creates value. So some of what we were doing was trying to clarify that, that confusion. What we were also probably trying to do was to intervene on the question of whether the abstraction of labor is just a mental abstraction, a setting aside or a disregarding of the concrete useful labors. So like it's not just a, a mental thing, but it's also like a real abstraction in the world in capitalist social relations. Right. There, there, there are, you know, there are different senses to this. And I mean, I, I would definitely say that, you know, the abstraction of labor as a mental process is ab absolutely crucial. But there is a, a, another sense in which the labor in reality becomes more and more abstract as capitalist production develops. The actual physical activities that people do and the actual way that the capitalists think of our work and we think of our work because value dominates everything and therefore the abstraction of labor dominates everything, the physical production process becomes more and more abstract, you know, on the ground in palpable technological reality as time goes on. And this is something that, that, that Marx uh, spoke about. So abstract in the kind of sense that it's like, like so that there is a, like a homogenization towards an unskilled kind of type of work, which is an expression of the increased abstraction of labor under capitalist mechanization. Well, to some extent, yeah, to some extent, the simplification, but, you know, a lot of work that people do is, isn't so simplified. But the fact that you've got time and motion study means that the, the elements of the work are being broken down across the whole gamut of different labors, across the whole gamut of different things that are being produced. But one of the things that Marx talks about most often is the fact that workers are indifferent to the kind of work that they do, you know, and that's kind of hard for us to understand because we're so steeped in this. But it used to be you know, people grew up and they were an apprentice to a barrel maker, a cooper, you know, and that's what they were, or a shoemaker, you know. That was, that was their, their life. That was their station in life. And now, you know, we were trained, we're educated, you know, so you could get a job doing this, you could get a job doing that, you could get a job doing the other thing. You don't really care, you know, because... You, you, you just want the paycheck. You just want the be better working conditions or, or whatever. And the capitalists are hiring workers from among a, a huge pool. You know, they don't really care who they, who they get because lots of people can do this job for most jobs. Moreover, the capitalists don't care what they produce. So they don't care about the useful products that they produce. They don't care about the concrete useful labor, therefore. I mean, the, the really classic example is like in the United States, when the steel market changes and the uh, production of steel becomes much better, much cheaper, you know, in Korea and, and wherever, these, you know, legacy steel companies, they got out of steel. They, they, they do other things. You know, the, the corporations still exist, but they, they, they don't produce steel in the United States. You know, so we, you had U.S. steel, mainstay of the U.S. economy, U.S. steel. It got out of steel making, became known as USX. X is an unknown. <laughs> and that, 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 you know, kind of tells the whole story. Just when you were talking about Coopers, it, it made me think about like in uh, the Guinness breweries in Dublin. In the, up until the 60s, I think, they used to use Coopers to make wooden barrels for all the Guinness that was exported around the world. And then just like the steel keg comes in and it's just like a whole, a large industry in the country just 
and a, a trade just gets decimated, you know, and that that kind of repeated occurrence throughout capitalism, yeah, towards just these unskilled types of labor, yeah, it's quite shocking when you when you look back even to the sixties, it's kind of hard to believe they were they were making like wooden barrels. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of shocking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this, this happens. This happens all the time. I mean, you know, there there is the de-skilling, but you know, to some extent, there are new skills created, but. The, the the basic idea that is so pervasive is the interchangeability and the temporary and fluid nature, you know, of all of this, of what's being produced, of who are the people involved in doing it, and you know, just the you know, the fact that, that one's labor is, is really not tied up with one's identity. It's an it's a massive change from you know the way society was under for instance uh, feudalism yeah or tight tight to your land or your guild right and is there anything in this paper we haven't covered that you wanted to cover no i mean i didn't think i would be speaking about the paper per se more about the the issues you know complex and simple labor and how it's a different reduction of complex to simple than the reduction of concrete labor to abstract labor, and that the reduction of complex to simple labor presupposes and requires already the reduction of concrete to abstract labor, you know, so that, again, when you talk about simple and complex labor, hello, they're both abstract labor. The problem is already solved. Okay, it's kind of getting late here, Andrew, and I know I've been an hour late. I don't know if you've got stuff planned. We were thinking we'd discuss a bit on uh, Jan Appel. I don't know. Do you have time now to do a bit? I have time to do a bit. I don't know how long it'll take. I, I could do a bit, yeah. Yeah, what, what, what specific? Because I haven't prepared questions for that because I kind of thought it'd be coming more from yourself. So um, let, let's see. Like, is there a particular I can ask you area? Questions. I can... Okay, yeah, fuck yeah. Go for that. That'd be interesting. What is it about his book that you like? On this episode, you heard the theme tune The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. Thank you.